raised by a woman. I was raised by a woman. I was raised by a woman. you being here so I'm just going to ask you a few questions and just again I want you to be as transparent so uh, my first question is how has being raised by a woman impacted your life well it's impacted my life in a positive way um, at this point and at this juncture I think I have a better respect for women in general and so you know the lessons that were learned um, being raised by a woman to respect women, to not put your hands on women. Uh, those things are huge, especially as I've become an older man um, and when I was a younger man. And so that impacted my life tremendously. So Terrence, so you were raised by a woman. Why was that? Where was your dad? Um, when I was three years old, my dad was murdered on New Year's Eve. Did you see it at the time or recognize at the time being, when you were being raised that it was uh, a challenge for you or for her? Um, at the time, I mean, initially when it happened, no. You know, being a three-year-old, four-year-old, not a big deal at the time. Um, maybe as the years went on, I started to question and ask what happened, you know, why, why my dad, you know, stuff like that. But um, it was hard growing up, it was hard, but you know, I had uncles, I had different other mentors that kind of kept me grounded and helped me kind of get to where I am now. Kari, thank you for being here. So how old are you, Kari? 17. 17 years old, and you've been raised by your mom, okay? Mm -hmm. How many siblings do you have? Two. Two siblings, a sister? And a brother. Two. Two years old. Okay, so talk to me uh, about some of the challenges that you see or that you're having or have had uh, by being raised without your dad. Some of the challenges I went through was um, growing up without a father figure. That's always important in growing up as a boy. Like being around so many women, it makes you think about women in a different light. It makes you... Um, cherish women more and appreciate them. And it didn't really affect me that much because I never really had the chance to go through like being with your father and stuff like that. So it didn't really affect me, but it made you look at women in a different light. Yeah, okay. Do you wish your dad was in your life? It's always important. I don't, I don't wish he was in my life because I don't, I don't understand like fully like what it feels like to have the presence of your father around, so I don't really wish he was in my life. Yeah. You really can't miss what you have never had. Mm -hmm. So those are the positive. What are some of the challenges you experience or maybe even experiencing now as a result of being raised by a woman? Well, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting question because when I was a younger man, there are only certain things that a woman can tell a man. And, and a young man at that, when you're going through puberty, um, that was an issue. Talking about sex with my mother was an issue. Um, dealing with the streets was an issue because a lot of times, you know, not having a father around to protect you. Um, but what I will say is this, I was more scared of my mother than I was the gangs in the streets of Chicago. So I can remember as a young man um, running for gangs and having to go around certain blocks in certain areas and guys trying to recruit me. But I used to tell them, I'm not joining your gang because I'm scared of my mama. She's way worse than you. So that's, that's some of the challenges, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? Do you feel like you missed out on something in your life by not having your dad around? Oh, absolutely. I'm a huge sports fan. 
And, you know, as a kid, you know, I probably didn't actually get into sports and probably to like 10, 11 years old. And a lot of that was just on my own. And I feel like, you know, that's one of the things dads do, you know, get your kid, take your kid to go play catch, stuff like that. And that's, that's definitely a huge thing I missed out on. Some of the challenges that you have had with your mother. I never really had many challenges with my mother, like typical stuff like father and mother, I mean, um, son and mother stuff like um, clean your room, stuff like that. I really never had no real challenges with my mother. Okay, okay. So you guys get along pretty well? Mm hmm Okay, all right. So let me ask you, as a, you're 17 years old, you're about to graduate from high school in a, in a little over a year, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what's your vision for your life? I see myself being productive, and if I do ever have kids, I see myself being a good father. You see yourself being a good father. What does a good father mean to you? Um, making sure your presence is felt within your, um, your child. And um, doing all you can to um, make sure that presence is felt. Okay, so you, you're present. I agree with you. It's important that you be present in your life. What else? Um, always. Um, never. You um, you never make your um, child feel like they don't need you because they do. Okay. Is it? Do you think it's important to provide for your children? Yes. Okay. And how do you do that? You provide for your children by making sure you never give up. You always do all you can, give 100%. What would you need in order to provide for your child? I would need to be, um, I would need to be, um, provide myself with stability. Yes. So I can make sure I do all I can to um, provide for my children. Yeah, stability, that's really important. My name is Deidre. So Deidre, thank you for being here. So you're a single mother. Yes, I how am. Many, how many children do you have? I have three children. Three children? Yes. One girl? Two sons. Two sons, two mm -hmm. sons. Do you mind telling us the ages of your sons? My sons are 17 and two. 17 and two, so mm -hmm. wow, the big difference. So, yes, it is. So you have uh, been raising a boy for 17 years. 17 long hard years, oh, yes I have. Years. Okay, that's what I want to talk about. Why, why do you say hard years? What has made them hard? Um, I mean, it's difficult raising children alone um, regardless, but the sons are different because you're a woman, they're a male, you know, they go through different changes in their bodies, their mentality is different, um, and some things a woman is just not suitable to fit for a son like a man would be. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So can you tell us some specific challenges you've had raising a boy? Um, well, specifically, um, like I said, the, the, the gender differences and, you know, like explaining the differences in their body parts. Like my teenage son, he had to go through the changes of, you know, the hormones and those type of physical changes that are different between a, a woman and a male. And um, also, as he grew older, I had to teach him about, you know, the influences of the streets, the police, being stereotyped, you know, not to fall into the wrong crowd as, you know, things like that. Yeah. Because, Deidre, because you have a daughter and you have two sons, can you talk to us about some differences you've seen between your son and your daughter? Because your daughter is just two years younger than your son? Correct. Yeah, so do you see that your son is more aggressive or is he more, is he quieter than your daughter? 
Well, now he's a lot more calm and quiet. When they were in their um, younger years, preteen years, he was a lot more hyper and energetic. So as he's grown older, there has been many differences in the boy and the girl. But the son now that I have, I mean, every child is different, but my son, Dakari, he um, is pretty calm and laid back. He's more reserved. He's a lot less emotional than my daughter. And, you know, his, his persona is just different altogether. Gotcha. And he's 17 years old. So 17 years in, looking back, what, if anything, would you have done differently than uh, now that you would have done differently if you had the chance? Um... If I could do anything differently, I mean, I obviously would have waited to have children until I was um, more suitable at a better age, for one. And secondly, I would have tried to choose a better partner, although you can't predict the future. I would have potentially waited to get married and be with someone who would have been more ready to take the parenting commitment more seriously. But other than that, I wouldn't do anything different because I know Every day that I woke up, every day that I laid eyes on him, I was giving him my 100% as, as his mother. Wow, that's beautiful, that's beautiful. So I'm gonna ask you a question that you might have to think about, but what is your vision for your sons? What do you see them 10, 20, 30 years from now? Um, I see great things for the both of them. They are both totally different in their personalities. Um, and my youngest son is only two, so, he has a lot of growing um, to do, obviously, but for my oldest son, I see great things for him. I know that he has a bright future ahead of him. He's overcome many odds already. He's um, taking the right steps towards, you know, steering away from the streets and bad influences. He's always been strong minded. So what I see for him is a bright future in whatever career he decides. I see a strong mind. I see him being a good father if he chooses to have kids because he knows the impact of not having a father. So I see him not falling into that stereotype. And I just see him being a good product of society. Like there's good in him and it shines very brightly. He's a bright child. Love that. That's, that's awesome. So indulge me for a second. This is the last opportunity that you can communicate with your sons. We're taking you guys away. If you had only one thing you could say to them before you never see them again, what message do you want to leave with your sons? Be the type of person that will be remembered for doing great things. So Camille, explain to us why were you a single mother? Um, I had my son when well, I got pregnant at the age of 17 years old. Um, I believe it was f due to lack of fathering for myself. Um, of course, I was very nervous, very scared, and all that good stuff or whatever. So this is why I was a mother, a single mother at 17 years old. So here you are, single mother, teenager, your first child is a boy. So talk to us about some of the challenges you experienced raising a boy. Um, I must say that I was very fortunate. I had a lot of support around me. Um, I had my mom and I also had his paternal grandmother and they were very supportive of, of me. Uh, my son's father was there up until the age of three years old and um, he was killed. So um, they stepped in and they really carried us all the way. So I, I, I'm very grateful to them for that. So your son is an adult now. Yes. What, looking back, what are some of the things, if anything, would you have done differently after having raised a boy? Um, when I thought of, when I read that question, I thought about it and thought about it. Um, I just wish that I could have gone a little further uh, education wise to support him um, financially a lot better. But I, I think that I made it my business to make sure that he had everything that he needed. 
I made it my business. I, I've always worked and did what I need to do to uh, legally, <laughs> let me say that, I'm a character. So um, I you know, did what I need to do. That way he would have everything that he always needed. I don't think that he ever knew that we struggled at times. And that was my, that was my goal for him not to even know that um, he was missing some things um, as far as financially. So Shakita, I'm really happy to have you here today. Who do you have with you? We have Agape Love Fitzgerald. Agape Love Fitzgerald, awesome. And how old is Agape Love Fitzgerald? He would be um, one on March 15th. One year old and about one week from today. Yes. So I want to talk to you about, so you, you are raising a boy, almost one years old. Are you afraid? I am terrified. Terrified? Why? Um, because number one, I know it's not easy raising a kid alone, let alone a black male. And um, because I want to make sure that I have in me everything that he needs to be a successful black man. So that haunts me every day. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. So you've been a mother for almost a year mm -hmm. now. What are some of the challenges you've experienced? Um, trying to co-parent with his father okay. has been the biggest challenge. Uh, trying to find out if it's worth co-parenting with his father and just making the best decisions for him. Interesting, you said, is it worth co-parenting? Why wouldn't it be worth it? Just because some of the things that's going on in his life, I'm not sure I want in Agape's life. And I know, you know, it's things you think about before even conceiving a child, but we are here. <laughs> and um, I just wonder if it's worth having him apart. Would it do more harm or more damage? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, a, good, that's a good concern to have. So he's one now, before mm -hmm. you know it, he'll be 21. What is your vision for Agape? To be a strong, successful black man, um, and I say success in whatever way that means to him. So um, just to be able to give him the tools that he needs to be able to chase a successful legal life. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you have a plan? <laughs> um, to keep him around as many strong black men as possible, um, to stay as firm and disciplined as I can be, to let my yes be yes and my no be no, and um, to affirm him and let him know who he is and who he's supposed to be. Okay. Now I want you to be honest with this question. Do you feel like you have what it takes to raise a boy? I'll give you a two-party answer. That's a loaded question. I'll say yes because, unfortunately, I saw all the women in my family do it. So I know that it's in me. Um, I'll say no because I absolutely believe that a male needs to be raised by a male. Good answer, good answer. So you're here now, you got a one year old, I know you've only been doing this for a year, but what advice would you give other women raising boys? Do your research. Hmm. Uh, okay. what do you mean? <laughs> um, seek out strong black men, um, read books, uh, listen to other mothers who um, have done it already and um, be open. I don't know everything, so I'm definitely open to the mothers who have taken this path. Hello, my name is Dr. Brian Humphrey. 
I am a licensed clinical health psychologist who provides psychological services across the Chicagoland area for individuals across the lifespan. There are a lot of things that I've seen throughout my experience, and today I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the impact that single mothers uh, or the lifestyles that uh, young men who are raised by single mothers can have on their mental health and their general well-being, psychological adjustment, and so forth. First, there are a few things I would like to clarify that are really some salient points to take away before we get into this discussion. A few of them are some things and there are misunderstandings that people sometimes have about mental health care, mental health illness, mental health disorders, all of these terms that we are uh, commonly bombarded with and we hear uh, referenced throughout our lives. And the, one of the biggest things I want to first talk about is differentiating a risk factor uh, from the actual development of a condition. So I like to talk about risk factors in terms of a ladder, what I like to call the ladder of risk. If you think about it, if you step on a step ladder that has maybe one or three steps, if you fall off that ladder, surely you might injure yourself, maybe spraying an, um, your, your arm or uh, your ankle, certainly maybe get a bruise, but more, than, more times than not, you'll generally be okay and recover. But as we go higher and ascend that ladder, the risk when we fall for injury to incur becomes greater. So if I were to go into a ordinary ladder, which is approximately 12 steps or more, and I fell off the top of there, there is a greater likelihood that more injuries may result. And to further, you know, uh, convey this, uh, this idea of the ladder of risk, if I got on a ladder on the top of the roof and I fell off that ladder, nine times out of 10, I might break something, sprain something, and death may ensue. When we think about risk, if we look at them as ascending the ladder of, of risk, the more ladder or the more steps that we ascend, the greater the likelihood of injury that may happen. It's the same analogy for mental health. So there is a huge misunderstanding when we're thinking about single parent homes, specifically single mothers who raise young men, that, that it within itself will result in mental health illness or psychological uh, maladjustment, and that's simply not always the case. Another way of looking at it is that single mothers who raise young men are within themselves a risk factor because of a myriad of different conditions, whether they're the stressors and the demands that come from a sole parent um, and some others that we'll talk about here in a few moments. But also, we know that as we ascend that ladder with other stressors such as environmental contingencies or issues, when we think about just general health and physical health issues that may develop, all of these things together comprise what we call risk. And that risk increases the likelihood that the individual, the young man in this instance, will experience anxiety, depression, or impulse control challenges such as anger management and so forth. There's also an important distinction between a psychological disorder and symptoms. So a psychological disorder is comprised of a multitude of symptoms that an individual experiences, but symptoms does not necessarily mean that an individual will have a disorder. So for example, uh, in the case of depression, an individual might have sad mood, they may feel tearful, they may also experience what we call anhedonia or a loss of interest or pleasure in doing things. But that doesn't mean that the individual will per se develop a, a major depressive episode. A major depressive episode does consist of the constellation of different depressive symptoms that result in an impairment in some area of functioning and are to such a degree that the individual is truly struggling to manage those. And so therefore, everybody who experiences depressive symptoms does not necessarily have a depressive disorder. And I think that distinction is very important because as we talk about risk factors, we again take a look at how risk uh, can increase the likelihood that symptoms are experienced, but also increase the likelihood that those symptoms could develop into an actual disorder. So that is why I say that a single mother is a form of a risk factor, but is not with itself correlated with the development of symptoms or even a disorder. So we have to be cautious as we are dealing with uh, the, the conceptualization of mental health for men as a product of or as a result of growing up in a single uh, parent home, namely that of their mother. Now, when we think about risk factors themselves that are 
each of those steps in that ladder that we discussed, there are uh, several that are very salient when we, think, when we think about single motherhood. One is obviously abuse and um, physical abuse and substance abuse. So if the mother is abusing substances or they are physically causing injury and insult to the child, we can say that there is certainly an increased risk that this individual is going to respond, that they're going to have uh, you know, psychological repercussions because of that experience. So the mother may be away because she is you know, pursuing or using drugs and they're not available uh, to, to care for the, for the young man, for example. Or um, it could very well be that if there is physical injury happening, that may also impact the way that the young man views himself. Another risk factor that we want to think about that, that causes, a, again, a greater tendency or likelihood that may result in symptoms and therefore potentially uh, disorders are uh, the stressors that come from the, di the dyad known as the mother and son growing up in that, uh, in, in that household, in that setting, that environment. And so what I mean by that is that typically a mother is going to incur a great deal of stress by being the sole provider for their child. And as such, that will result in the individual, uh, you know, the mother dealing with heightened level of stress, high, heightened level of demand, psychosocial stressors, or just stressors that are, affect one's psychology, sociology, uh, etc. And that can be transferred and impact the young man. So the young man can internalize the mother's response to certain circumstances or they themselves can be the recipient of the stress that the mother has. So the mother may come in frustrated, tired, and in an, in an innocent you know, you know, response to an inquiry, for example, from a young man may say something that the young man may interpret or perceive as being harsh or threatening, therefore affecting their mood. That last part is another component that I would like to talk about, which is the actual perceptions that young men can have from the actual legitimate stressors that they experience in their day-to-day -day life or the experiences that they perceive from their mother. And there is a notion here that we talk about that are known as cognitive vulnerabilities. One particular cognitive vulnerability is that of rumination or the tendency to really focus and, 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 and think about a particular topic, a particular stress, or a particular event over and over and over again. And so individuals who are experiencing things such as anxiety or depression or significant anger will oftentimes, young men will focus on those symptoms, focus on that condition, focus on that state of being, and then begin to ruminate about the triggers or the causes that led them to feel that way, and then also ruminate about the repercussions that result once they are engaging in that particular action. So if they're depressed and they're not eating or they're not socializing, they may think about what the consequences of that may have on, say, friends, interpersonal relationships, and or siblings. Likewise, in the case of anger, the individual may you know, and react in rage or anger to different circumstances that may be greater than what we would expect for a given event that may cause that particular anger response. And therefore they may wonder and ruminate about what caused that actual anger outburst? Why am I feeling angry? Why am I having a challenging time uh, controlling that? And what about the repercussions of acting on that anger? A very key component that the research also suggests is a notion that um, typically single mothers are very much uh, engaging in psychological controls, as we call them, as we call them, namely overprotectedness and maternal rejection. So this notion of overprotectedness really comes from a desire to control uh, different environmental contingencies that may affect the child or the environment itself. But also, they may also look to try to prevent the child from experiencing harm just for the sake of their child and the love they have of their child. But also, because as a single mother, if the, the young man is engaging in a particular behavior where it's going to now cause additional time off from work that the mom might not have, etc., they want to control for that. And so when they are not able to control for that, then we could reasonably expect for example, that the child is going to be a little bit more exploratory in how they 
regulate or identify or react or respond to circumstances. So when there is a level or an aspect of overprotectedness that unfortunately results in the young man not being able to develop the internal resources to be able to regulate uh, the, the feelings that they may have. Certainly not always the case, but again, when we think about risk factor, it increases the likelihood that this phenomenon will happen. And so what ends up happening is that a, a, a young man will grow to become reliant or expectant on the environment to shift and adjust itself so that they are able to deal with whatever the circumstances are. Hello, my name is Pastor Derek White. I'm the pastor of the Fellowship of Love Christian Center in Hammond, Indiana, and I'm also the executive director for the Father's Heart Fatherhood Initiative Program. So Pastor White, thank you for being here. Um, we want to talk a little bit about fatherhood. I know you've done a lot of work in the community mm -hmm. down through the, through the years. So talk to us, first of all, about uh, the importance of fatherhood. That's, that's a loaded question. It's a loaded question, but it's an excellent question. The importance of fatherhood. Um, first of all, let me say this, that fatherhood is a calling. To be a father, it's a calling. And it's the um, highest calling that a man can fulfill uh, because when a man fulfills that calling of a father it's not just about him but it's literally about the generation that he brought forth and uh, when we consider fatherhood uh, the generation that is coming underneath that man is going to be impacted or it can be positive or it can be negative depending upon how the father is really fulfilling his role um, fatherhood is the um, foundation the foundation of the family and when you think about the foundation uh, of a building if i can use that as a quick analogy uh, the foundation of a building is typically not seen because once you begin to build the, the, that structure you, you got the walls you have the ceilings you you uh you, you have the windows but the foundation is underneath but the strength of that building or the strength of that foundation gives the uh, the necessity that, or the power of how you can really build and how high you can build that building. So if the foundation is strong, the building can be very stable. So now if I use the example of a father being the foundation of a family, the, the family can be very stable if the foundation is stable, if that father is strong, if that father knows his role and his responsibilities and therefore um, the, the, the family can be strong and if you got strong families because of a strong father then we ultimately have what strong communities and uh, with strong communities then we can begin to bring a strong build a strong society but it all goes back to fathers and fatherhood okay I, I have been um, afforded the opportunity to um, to be the program manager for a a program called fatherhood in action which was um, under the umbrella of the Salvation Army. Uh, that program is no longer in existence because it was federally funded and it no longer got funded. However, for five years, we were able to impact fathers throughout the Chicago metropolitan region. I mean, we literally touched approximately 1,500 dads and it, it was really a powerful, powerful endeavor. And so since then, um, since we no longer have that program, that particular program, we, I've started my own program. And that's why I'm the executive director for the Father's Heart. Now, the Father's Heart program is a program that uh, is, is, is reaching, strengthening fathers to strengthen their relationship with their children. And so therefore, the heart of fathers, and we found this to be true, with most of the fathers that we have worked with, predominantly all of the fathers we've worked with, they love their children and they want to be in the, in the life of their children. And the heart of that father is their children. The heart of God as our father is us as his children. So therefore we've adopted the name, the father's heart. Now the work that we've done in the community has been very, very impactful. We have worked with men from Cook County Jail, uh, the rehabilitation centers, um, throughout the various churches on the southwest sides of Chicago, and even in the um, South suburban communities of Chicago. We have worked with men from Restoration Ministries in the South suburbs. So we've, we've touched men uh, of all cultures, all ethnicities, and it's been a very, very um, effective work. We have seen fathers uh, 
who weren't fathered themselves coming to the realization of their role and their responsibility. So we've uh, we've really helped quite a bit, quite a few fathers in in the city of Chicago. So I want you to talk a little bit more about what you just said, fathers who are not fathers themselves. What type of impact does a man have, or what type of impact was there on men attempting to be fathers but didn't have a father? So talk to us about that. That that's when when men have not been fathered. Uh, that's a very, very um, major problem today. It's a major problem. Um, in the nation, in the nation, United States, one out of every um, three homes, three families, the father is absent. But in Chicago, approximately 50% of the homes, the father is absent. And when fathers are absent, there's a, there's a lot of detrimental impact that has, it has upon the children and the family. Now, uh, when fathers have not been fathered, the problem is they don't really know exactly how to do it. And that might seem like a very um, strange thing to say. And you might say, well, they should just know how to do it. Mm -mm. Many do not. They don't understand their role. They don't understand uh, the importance of their role. Many of them don't. Uh, it's not just automatic or sometimes they just don't try. But I'll just be, be candid and say it this way. When they have not been fathered, there's a lot of barriers. They're confronted with barriers because they have never had an example. They've never had an example of a father to father them. And when they have not had an example of a good father in their life, where do they learn fatherhood? They either learn it from television, the images that they see on TV, or they'll learn it from uh, the community, people that they see on the streets or other families. And, and it's not always the best example if they have not had a, a, a true father in their life, in their home growing up. It's, it's, it's major, the, the, the impacts are major. The, the results are just, um, it, it's sad to see because when fathers are not there, children really do suffer. So you worked for five years, you touched the lives of uh, over 1,500 men. Can you give us a, a specific example of how you worked with a particular young man? What were some of his issues and maybe what were some of the uh, wins and things that he was able to overcome? Oh, there's many, there's many, <laughs> where to begin. Um, I'll take an example uh, of a father who was in our program. We met this particular father at the Cook County Department of Corrections. Uh, this father at the time, he was 45 years old, had seven children and seven co-parents. With the seven co-parents, of course, you know, there's challenges. Now, his life, his father was never in his life growing up. His mother had a lot of challenges. She was in prostitution and just a lot of things in her life. And so she was not there on a regular basis. However, she did care about her children. So every month she would bring money just to help the family. But this particular man, he came into our program in the jail and he learned what it meant to be a father. He learned that it was not his role to try to, as he said, kick it with his children. But he learned that he had to lead his children and not try to be uh, their, their friend to the degree of just doing everything that they were doing and acting like they were on the streets. He realized that he had to change and become a leader to, for his children and to guide them. Because uh, he came to also realize that if he didn't change, his children were gonna continue to go down a road that was not right. So the results in his life were extremely meaningful. So when he got out of jail, when he got out of jail, he became much more involved in his children's lives uh, maybe it's like five out of the seven because some of the other two lived out of state, but he also communicated with those children, um, of course, through telephone and other, other means of communication. But he got heavily involved with his children. He realized that his role was um, to be there because children, basically what they want is not that they want money. They want your time. They, they, they need your time. They, they want to spend time with you. So he, he realized that through our program and through the work that we were doing. It changed the trajectory of his life and caused him to understand 
how important it was for him to be a leader, to be a guide, to, to be there to nurture his children. He didn't know that before, you know, because um, we taught the men and we teach the men, we teach the men the importance of nurturing, you know. So many, many men think that um, nurturing is just the mother's job. To nurture a child basically is to give care and attention to someone who's being developed. So a child's being developed. As a child's being developed, they need the nurturing from the mother and the father. You know, they need to care. And so this particular man, he, he learned that. And so many of the other fathers, they learned the importance of nurturing, showing care and attention to their children. Not even as children, even as teenagers, just showing that care and the attention that they needed. And, and we have so many results where fathers really became aware. Because in our program, what we do, we don't deal with the deficits of the band. We deal with their strengths. We focus on their strengths because we, we, all the men, they do come to the table with strengths. And we capitalize on that and help them to realize that the potential is in you to, to strengthen the relationship with your children and your co-parents. And the results are phenomenal. Awesome. So talk to us about it. You mentioned this earlier that most fathers that are absent from their children's lives want to be fathers. But there is this thing where there is challenges. You, you, you use the term co-parent. I'm going to use the street term, baby mamas. Sometimes mm -hmm. there's a challenge. There's a lot of baby mama drama. So talk to us. Talk to the men that are having issues with being in their children's lives because of challenges that they have with the mother of their children okay what advice would you give them well very very good question because research research has shown that the key predictor that's going to help fathers get engaged with their families their fathers assuming with their children when they want to be there they have to get a better relationship with the co-parent they're going to have and so we in our program we teach them how to be mindful of their relationship with the co-parent. Because sometimes if, they're, if, they're, if there's a problem between that co-parent and the father, it's gonna be very difficult to get to that child. Extremely difficult. So we, we teach them how to be mindful of the co-parent's personality and your, their personality. Because we, we teach the fathers to understand you cannot control that co-parent. The only one that you can, can control is yourself. So we encourage them to do their part to strengthen the relationship. We, we teach from, we give them the, 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 the keys. And one of the keys we say is do your part, make it safe. And when you can, when you can do your part to control your responses and, and, and to be a, a, of a, of a um, strength to the family, you can build that relationship with the co-parent so that you can work together for the good and the benefit of that child. Um, because that, that's, that, that's one of the major problems. And mo out of many of these fathers, most of the fathers, well, today's society, there's multiple co-parents, multiple co-parents. Many of them have more than, you know, one child. And it's, it's a serious issue right now. And that's why the, um, the government is even invested in, this, in these programs to help to bring the families back together. So if you could just give, and you've given a lot of, good concepts already, but if you can pick, and you might have to think about this one, if you can pick three things, and only three things, that you would tell a man that is absent from his children's life to strengthen that or to rebuild that relationship, what are the top three things you would tell them that a man must do? Okay. The top three things that a man must do to build their relationship with their children. Number one is time. Take time out with your child, no matter what their age be, and listen. No matter what their age is, take time out because the children want time with their father. Next thing I would say is to provide, um, provide um, the identity, because let me say it this way. Fathers provide identity to their children. And when they provide identity to their children, it's first of all, when they understand who they are first, when they understand who they are first, then they can um, begin to 
uh, walk in the characteristics of a true father that would then cause their children to see uh, the examples that they need to see. And, and if I can go back to this thing with dealing with identity for a minute, um, fathers are to follow the example of our Heavenly Father, if I go that direction. Uh, God has made man and God gave man the same title that he has. And that's the title of father. So when we think about that, man is getting his identity from God as the father. And when we understand if God has given man the title of the, the same title that he has, that lets us know that there's a, a high designation, a high honor that's put upon fathers. And identity begins to be revealed when men understand how important they are, their role is as a father because it takes true fathers to make and produce true fathers. True fathers produce true fathers. So when a father knows who he is in God, though his maker and his creator, he can then reproduce true fatherhood, you know, into his children, protection and everything like that. So identity is something that fathers give when they know who they are uh, as, as a father. Uh, so time, identity, and you want to basically know the three. Okay, give me one more. Um, one more pastor. Okay, another, another one would be time, identity. What about mm. provision? Is that important? Well, provision is definitely pro important because fathers give so much. They give provision. The, the, the point of providing uh, not just finances. Finances is vitally important because uh, children have needs. The family has needs, you know. Uh, so therefore, with provision, it goes back to even to the nurturing, just showing that care, providing nurturing, providing guidance, providing leadership. And here it is, providing love. Because love is, is the key, unconditional love. Because God, our Father, if we take the example as men and we follow the example of our Heavenly Father, God shows us unconditional love. No matter what we do, where what we say, he still loves us. And as fathers, this is what I would say to every father, show your children what's in you, which is love, unconditional love. No matter what they say, no matter what happens, let them know that you will always be there, not, not just in words, but in actions. And that, that's where that love comes in. So it would be time, identity, and provide for them and give them love said a lot this is great but obviously this is a topic that's near and dear to your heart you mm -hmm. have invested a lot of time money and energy in this so i want you to dig deep pastor and this what are your parting words what would you say if you had a father sitting in front of you uh what would you say to inspire him to challenge him to turn to make a change just give us some parting words okay I would say this, that two words, fathers matter. Fathers are significant. The role of a father cannot be substituted because research has shown that when fathers are absent from a child's life, fathers, uh, children tend to end up, tend to end up into either drugs, um, sexually being sexually abused, uh, they tend sometimes they end up to be poor. They sometimes to have challenges with uh, academics. Uh, they don't know how to know how to show empathy. Uh, when when fathers are absent, the impact is just so vital, and 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 uh, and it's just so detrimental. So when but when fathers are present, children tend to have they tend to learn better social skills. Uh, they, they especially empathy. They know how to show care for others when fathers are present because they have learned it from their father's care and protection. So I would truly say this fathers matter. They mean more than this world may give credit to because uh, uh, love, guidance, protection, all these things come from the dad. You know, fathers are teachers. Fathers teach children and they impact the next generation, you know. Uh, and, and, and when we think about all that, fathers are also the covering of the family. And not only fathers, let me just say, it's an innate, 
ability within a man to be a father. Fathers in our community, we need men in the community to understand that even if you have not sired a child, you are still walking in the capacity as a father, as a leader, making a difference in, in the community because that's what, who men are, your leaders. So I, I encourage men to walk in who God has made you, a father, the strength of a father. And I'll say this, fathers are progenitors. And progenitors are, that, that's someone who has originated something, created something, someone who develops something. So fathers have the ability to develop the life and touch the next generation and cause there to be a difference in the life of the, of the, of the next generation. And if we really want to strengthen our society and make a difference in our society, it's going to go back to the foundation that strong fathers lay in the home. That's really where it's that, that's really where it is, because every every household is made up of families and the families have the father there in a positive engagement. And if that family is strong, ultimately, if we can begin to have strong families like that, we're going to begin to have stronger communities, stronger communities are then going to be what stronger states, stronger. Our country becomes stronger when there's some, an investment in the father and teaching that those principles, because the principles that's really what's going to make the difference, understanding the values and the principles of fatherhood. Hello there. Uh, my name is John Jamison. I am 40 years old. I'm originally from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and have spent uh, the last 17 years in Chicago. Now I'm living down in Austin, Texas. And uh, participating in this documentary because I was raised by my mom for the most part. Uh, my parents were divorced when I was 10 years old and uh, my father moved across the country. We were living in Pennsylvania at the time and he moved up to Alaska. So to be fair, uh, my father was still very much in my life but geographically he was on the other side of the continent and so I saw him maybe once or twice a year. So um, being raised by a woman has definitely impacted my life um, because my mom is absolutely wonderful. She's a fantastic person. She um, has been wonderful in many ways in setting a good example and teaching me to be responsible and I'm just very grateful for all of the things, you know, that she has instilled in me from being responsible to, um, you know, always doing my best. And she really just in instilled all, all of the right values in me. And, you know, had a bonus that um, my, my older sister as well was living with us. So, and she always set a good example. So it's been very positive by being raised by a woman and being raised by a woman has impacted uh, relationships that I have with other women um, in a positive way because, you know, I've had positive relationships with the women in my life and my family growing up, whether it's my mom, my sister, my mom had three sisters and, and they were all wonderful. So I had good relationships with my aunts. So naturally, since I had those trustworthy relationships as a foundation as an adolescence, naturally, I think it was easier for me to establish positive relationships with women. Um, so I was very grateful for that. But for um, some individuals who may not have the healthiest relationships with a mother or with an older sister, that doesn't necessarily you know, have to be the case as you meet other women um, and those relationship behaviors shouldn't necessarily transcend um, in how you treat other women because that's not really fair to them. So I guess the, the point is, if you have healthy relationships with, with your mother or other women in your family, it might be a bit easier um, and you'll be faster to, to trust other women, which is a, which is a great thing. Uh, but just because you may not have had the healthiest relationship with, mo with mom or another woman in your family, that doesn't have to be the case. So uh, challenge your assumptions and just be very careful about what baggage, so to speak, you're bringing to a relationship.
And for women who are currently raising boys alone, uh, there are really two pieces of advice I would give. The first is be very careful on bringing other men around your, your sons or children in general, and especially sons, because when they're young, um, they're sponges in their environment. And so whatever behaviors the, the, the men that you're bringing around your, your boys exhibit will be uh, modeled and therefore going to be normal to your son. So if they're you know, very respectful to you, bringing flowers, um, very kind to the kids, like that's that's best case scenario. But uh, bringing a lot of men around and different shows a lack of stability in relationships. So I'd be very, very careful um, on the number and also the, the, the quality of the man because again, you know, young boys are going to model their behavior as, you know, they and think that that's normal. And then, um, also in, you know, in taking care of your boys, however you act will become their normal um, in terms of, you know, how you're raising them in that relationship that you have with your boys, like that's the, the foundation for relationships that they will have with females in the future. So similar to my story. And again, I was very grateful. So for women, the best thing you can do is have a healthy relationship. It's very standard and very basic. Um, but that's the truth. And for a young boy who's being raised by a woman, I know that I always didn't make it as easy on my mom as I should have. But, you know, what I would say is that, you know, it is not easy raising a boy as a woman. Um, Treat her with respect, first and foremost. I can't overemphasize that. Second, best practice, whether it's your mom, your sister, whomever, Surprise your mother with flowers. Doesn't even have to be on her birthday, Mother's Day, Valentine's Day. Those are all good. But if you just surprise your mom with flowers randomly, it doesn't have to be a massive bouquet. It'll go a long way. Trust me. And then finally, I got this tip from a friend. On your birthday, call your mother and thank her for bringing you into this world. It means the world. I'm Kiana Trotter. And I'm Jacob Trotter. So thank you guys for being here. So Ms. Trotter, you are the mother of Jacob Trotter. Yes. Okay. So uh, may I ask how many children do you have? Four. Four children. And Jacob is the oldest. Is the oldest. Okay. So you raised him uh, pretty much as a single mom. Yes. Jacob, how old are you? I'm 24. Okay. So let's start out by talking about um, what are some of the challenges you experienced by raising a boy? Um, the, the hardest challenge, my biggest challenge, was keeping him out the streets. Um, by him being the oldest, I didn't want him to feel pressured um, to help me in any way. Um, keeping him safe because I was at work a lot and um, I didn't want the streets to pull him since I'm gone and he outside and get involved in something looking for that fatherly absence in the streets. So when, so go back, take me back to 24 years ago, Jacob okay. is a baby. Okay. Did you, at the time, did you feel fear, fearful or were you confident that you had it? What was your thoughts? Well, going back that far, the plan wasn't to be a single mom. Um, It turned out that way. The relationship with his father was very bad. And um, when when we separated, I just had to do what I had to do. And um, so at that point, yes, I was very scared, um, afraid. At that time, it was three kids. And um, I was afraid of doing it on my own with two boys. Yeah. 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 At that time, Jacob, when your parents split, I don't know how old you were, but K 
Can you recall that situation and how you felt when they split? Um, yeah, I can recall. Um, I don't. I didn't really understand. I was kind of confused on what was happening because it was like now my dad got a different house. Like you know, what I'm saying like I was confused on what was happening and what. I couldn't process it until I got older. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. yeah. So, Miss Trotter, Jacob is a big boy. He has yeah. thick skin. He can take it. The reason why I say that, because I want you to be honest. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about how Jacob has turned out? I'm very proud of him. Okay. I'm very proud of him. Um, so, from little BJ, oh <laughs> um, I didn't think he was going to be okay. He was very hurt. Um, when me and his dad split, and I thought he was traumatized to the fact that he wouldn't function quite well. But he's great, I'm proud of him. Wow, wow, that may be most of right there. Um, so if you had the chance to do it all over again, what would you do differently in raising Jacob? In raising him? Mm -hmm. I would allow him to be more free. Um, I tried really hard um, to instill good things in him. And um, sometimes I think I went too far and I suppressed, or it caused him to suppress um, him being the person he was trying to be. But I wanted him to be a man. And, uh, if I could do it over again, I wouldn't do that. Yeah. Wow. You three feel like he missed out on some things? Yes. Yeah. Because okay. he was the oldest. Yeah. Um, I was at work. My schedule was 4 to midnight. Um, but we had to do what we had to do. We had to live. So yeah. Yeah. he missed a lot. Yeah. And I missed a lot. Jacob, do you feel like you missed out on some things by not having your dad there? Yeah. Um, only for the simple fact I felt like I had to grow up pretty fast because I had siblings. And I'm not saying I'm their father or anything, but I had to show them some type of leader from the little knowledge that I did have. And by my mom being gone, I had to step up. So she's gone, she's working four to 10. Be honest, you can be honest now, you're 24. <laughs> what were you doing? <laughs> Honestly, everything. <laughs> patronizing my siblings, <laughs> you know, you know what I'm saying? We was always getting into it and everything. My little brother got to the uh, age where he's like calling mama about everything, you know what I'm saying? And I felt like I had no control. Mama left me in charge and he calling mama, so she, automatically thinking like, oh, now I can't leave y'all alone and everything. So I felt like I was, I was, I don't even know. I don't know. I was being like a bad, good big brother. So, you know what I'm saying? I was doing whatever I could, you know what I'm saying? So. Yeah. yeah. All the good stuff. You didn't do anything bad. Like bring people over. Yeah. That's maybe the, once or twice, yeah. but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, yeah, actually I did. So you snuck a few girls in there. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. Like I, I did um, when we lived uh, when I was going to. Um, what was? Huh? <laughs> when I was going to uh, Wentworth, yeah. Um, Wentworth. Yeah, grammar school. Okay. But yeah, but they like no grammar like, school left out the back door. Oh. And I thought I was. Okay. I mean, but like, but in my defense. I made sure the house was clean, so they didn't. No. I, I did. I did. That day, that day I did. That The house was clean. The dish was clean. Everything was clean, so. So it was all good. Yeah, everything was good, okay. but, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, Ms. Trotter, let's, let's talk for a second. So, okay. Jacob is hitting puberty. Okay. He's growing facial hair. His voice is Barely. changing. You know, his muscles are getting bigger. Was there ever a moment that you felt intimidated? Because now he's getting bigger and stronger. I didn't feel intimidated. I felt the need to um, 
up up my uh how can I say it? <laughs> Get your weight up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I felt the need to intimidate him more, you yeah. know. Um he started getting taller than me. So now I'm looking up. So now I got to pull out golf clubs and any <laughs> any method of intimidation I can because you still can get it. That was what I was trying to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get that, I get that. Jacob, was there ever a moment, okay, again, you 14, 15, you a man, was there ever a moment when you felt like your mother was overreacting to something that you did? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> All the time. I felt, because I'm like, and that, that goes back to when you asked me about how to handle in situations, you know what I'm saying? Like, I seen the way my mom handled situations with me, it wasn't like talking to me, you know what I'm saying? It was like a, it was at me, you know what I'm saying? But at the same time, like I had, a, we remember my mom was talking the other day, um, she had to do that. And I didn't understand that until now because she can't, she didn't have the room to be like, oh my baby, oh oh this and oh that, mm -hmm. because there was no man there to be like, no, toughen up. So she had to stay in that type of zone. And the longer she stayed in that, that, that mentality, she became that. that. And it was like, my mama mean, like I, I felt like I couldn't talk to her, you know what I'm saying? But now that I'm looking back on it, I felt like it was necessary because I'm not soft. I knew you know that was the goal. And I didn't want them to be soft. Yeah, awesome. and I felt like if she was like, oh, my baby all the time, I would be soft. I would let somebody walk all over me, you know what I'm saying? And I'm glad that she did do what she do because not only am I not soft, I also have a sensitive side to actually think about certain things from a woman's perspective also. So do you feel like because you were raised by a woman that um, it improved how you relate to women, in, especially in romantic settings? Yes. Okay. Honestly, because sometimes as men, we look at, why you, why you acting like that? Like, you know what I'm saying? But when you actually grow up in a household of women and being around women so much, you like, okay, I understand that you're feeling this way because if I was to do this, I w if you was to do this to me, I would feel this way too, but I wouldn't express it the way you do. So, yeah, I feel like I wish I could have handled certain situations a little bit better. Yeah. So, Ms. Trot, I'm gonna ask you a question that I've asked a lot of women, and this may cause you to have to think for a minute. Okay. But what is your vision for your sons? Because you have two sons, correct? I have two correct? sons, yes. What is your vision for them? My vision? Um... I want them to be um, great men. That is my vision. Um, productive, um, good fathers, good husbands, um, mentally stable people. That that is my vision, and for them to follow their hearts and succeed at anything that they do in life. Awesome. So Jacob, let me ask you, do you see yourself being a husband and a father one day? Yeah. Do you feel like you're capable of being a successful father and husband? Mm -hmm. Only because I see, you know, no disrespect, I see the things that my parents made mistakes on. So, and I kind of see them from both sides, but living with my mom, um, I seen it from her side, so I will understand my wife a little bit better. And I know from my father, no disrespect, I know what not to do. You know what I'm saying? Um, I want to let my kids be free who they are. No matter if you gay, straight, you know, no matter who you date, I want them to be able to come to me. And I want to be able to comfort them and know that their father still loves them that their father knows them, you know what I'm saying? A lot of fathers that I've seen don't really know their kid. They know of their kid, but they don't know their kid. Okay. And the analogy I use is, you know what I'm saying, I don't want to be on the basis of what's your favorite color every time I see my child or talk to my child. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to speak to your father. Mm -hmm. What would you 
What do you want your father to know? Expl talk to him from when you were 3, 14, 20 years old. Speak directly to him. What do you want him to know? Um... I've, okay. Dad, the things you were trying to teach me on how to be a man didn't necessarily make me not a man. Uh, what I mean by that is I did sports in high school and I did cheerleading. Just because I did cheerleading doesn't make me less of a man or less masculine. Um, I feel like you didn't allow me to express myself and without making you uncomfortable about my sexuality. Um, my sexuality at that, at that age wasn't, wasn't relevant, honestly, because I wasn't thinking about it until you brought it to me. Um, I wish that me and you got closer on the aspect of life and not about women every time I talk to you. Um, I tell you about the things that I'm doing, such as photography and stuff like that, and sometimes you don't seem interested unless it's about a half-naked woman, to be honest. Um, like again, I said no disrespect, but I feel Everything is about if I'm straight or if I'm gay. I'm straight, but I feel like that's why is that why does that matter how much you love me or how much you are in my life? Um we had the conversation about you getting to know me better and I told you, I opened up to you and I told you like I want you to get to know me. It's never too late. I will never close you out because you're my father. But at the same time, if you make the effort, then I can open up to you. But if you don't make the effort, I have to love you from a distance. And the mistakes you made with me that I feel, I know I, I won't make the same mistakes with my children or my son, for to be exact. So that's what I would say to you, Dad. That's awesome. So last question for you, Ms. Turner. I know I said that was the last question. Yeah. This is the last <laughs> question. Talk to that young woman. Get single mothers. You've raised two sons now. They're great young men. Okay. What advice would you give that single mother that's raising a one-year-old boy or, or a 15-year-old boy? What advice would you give them? Um, what advice would I give them? But what kept me going is prayer. A lot of prayer, a lot of conversations, a lot of crying, a lot of, because it was very challenging, um, especially when you yourself, um, I'm from the hood, and a lot of that was in me, and trying not to push that myself on my boys, um, so my advice would be just to do the best you can, pray, um, I never looked at it as boys and girls. I just put my all into my kids. And if you love your kids and you give them your all, they will be successful people. My name is Paul Phillips and I'm the founder and the CEO of the Better Man Than Me Foundation, which I started back in April of 2011. And one of the main reasons why I started this organization is because I wanted to improve the lives of young men as a child, I struggled. Uh, I came from uh, very humble beginnings. I was raised by a single mother and we struggled quite a bit. And I, particularly, I struggled because I had a lot of anxiety, a lot of issues. I was a very timid young man. And I believe a lot of the reasons for my anxiety is because of the fact that my father wasn't present in my life. Uh, it was an issue for me. And as I grew and I looked at other young men, a lot of my peers, they also 
were growing up in houses where their father wasn't present. Uh, the difference between me and them, it appeared that they didn't struggle as much. And I know that everybody is different. So one of the things I vowed when I was younger is that when I became an adult and I, I was able to succeed in life that I wanted to give back. Uh, the Better Man Than Me Foundation has mentored almost 10,000 young men in the past 10 years. And 80 to 90% of those young men are being raised by their mother or their grandmother. So that is a substantial amount of young men without their father's presence in their life. So I began to think a few years ago, how do I address this issue? And one of the ways I wanted to do it is to produce this documentary to understand the effects on young men's lives being raised by a woman. So let me start by saying that uh, I pay tribute and homage to women that have the strength and the ability to raise children by themselves, especially women that are raising young men. I believe personally that the best person to raise a man child is a man. Um, I know a lot of women that have done it and have done it well, but I believe that we as men miss out in life when we are not with uh, our fathers. I think it is the man's job to tell a young man or to teach a young man his value and his worth. I believe that we as young men are born with the innate desire to be connected to our fathers and to please our fathers and to make them proud. So as I grew in life, as I said, I struggled. And I'm gonna be a bit transparent here. I remember growing up and there were things that I simply didn't know. And I looked at my peers and they seemed to naturally adapt to things that I struggled with. Um, and I believe that was because my dad was just absent. I remember uh, when I was about five or six years old, taking the trash out and I put on my mother's, what we call house shoes. I remember a man in the neighborhood reprimanding me, stopping me and telling me, don't you ever come out of the house wearing women's apparel. Uh, so that kind of stuck with me. I also remember little things like uh, being uh, in the group of young men. I remember once when we were at an event with a group of young men and a, uh, I went to use the washroom and I'm being a bit transparent here. Leaving the washroom, I did what I had to do. I'm running out of the uh, washroom and I remember an older guy, he must've been a teenager at the time, stopping me and said, hey, aren't you gonna wash your hands? Something that really didn't dawn on me, but those little things stuck with me. And I think I would've uh, not struggle with things like that if my dad was in my life. I remember once sitting in a group setting with a bunch of young men and I happened and I had to be about 10 years old and I happened to notice for one reason I'm looking around and all of the young men were and this is going to sound a little weird were sitting differently and I literally looked and saw that I was sitting like a little girl would sit and I actually adjusted the way I was sitting these are the little things that as a young man growing up that I struggled with. Cause not only was I not raised with my dad in the home, but I was raised by my mother, my grandmother, and my three sisters present. So there was absolutely zero male influence in my home and my life growing up. So as an adult, I began to uh, really reminisce on those particular things. And believe it or not, it took me till the time I was about 40 years old to be literally comfortable in the presence of other men because I didn't know uh, how to relate. I didn't know how to comprehend a lot of different things. Now, a lot of people didn't know that because I was a great actor, but internally, I had a lot of anxiety. I had a lot of confusion. And that was literally because I did have a father, in my opinion, in my life. So this conversation is not about um, disrespecting men, but it's about understanding the impact of fatherlessness on the lives of young men. So 
when we talk about fatherlessness, uh, I think it's a serious issue. A lot of, of people talk about the violence in the black community and whether black on black crime is an issue, is it real or not? One, I believe one of the root causes for the crime that we see in our community is because there are a lot of absent fathers. We see a lot of young men that we mentor that simply are hopeless and do not value life. And I believe one of the reasons for that is because they are fathers that are absent. It is a father that teaches his son and his daughter the value that they have. It's a father that lets his son know that he is valuable, that he is worth uh, loving, and that he is enough. Many of us grow up in life having that, uh, have having issues with self-esteem and struggle with the fact, am I enough? Am I smart enough? Am I uh, intelligent enough? Am I strong enough? And I believe that comes from a lack of value that's put on us as children many times by our parents. So when we look at the crime in our community, again, I think if we had more fathers in the in our lives, in the lives of our young men, because most crimes are committed not by young women, but by young men. And I believe it's our fathers that should be present, that should teach us the value of life and should hold us accountable. Many times we as young men are just simply full of testosterone and we're just very energetic. That is natural, but it is our fathers that help us set standards in our lives. It's our fathers that hold us accountable. It is our fathers that teach us the value of a strong work ethic. It is our fathers that teaches us to persevere when we experience challenges in our lives. And when we have absent fathers, a lot of those things we struggle with when we don't have to. A lot of those things we uh, struggle with and we learn along the way when we're 20, 30, and 40, when we should learn it when we're 10, 15, 18, 20 years old. I remember growing up in life and uh, there are particular times in my life where I really wanted my dad. I remember I got married when I was 22, 22 years old and that was a moment in my life where I wanted my dad present. I wanted to sit down and have a conversation with my father to ask him, am I making the right decision? Is this the right mate for me? I remember having marital problems later on, many years later, and I wanted my dad to sit down and say, am I approaching this correctly? Am I making the right decision? Am I relating to my wife in the right way? I really desire to have my dad. When I went through a divorce, that was a moment in my life where I wanted to sit down and have a conversation with my father. There are pivotal times in every young man's life when he needs his father. A male role model is, is uh, advantageous, but there are times when a man sits down and he desires to have a conversation with his father. And when the father is not present, there's a missing and there's a gap in every man's life. Do we overcome it? Do we succeed? Do we cope? Absolutely. But it is incumbent upon us as men to be present in the lives of our children. I remember many years ago, I was mentoring a young man. He was about 30 years old. He had three felonies and he had spent significant time in jail. And at this time in his life, he had multiple children. In fact, I think he had six children, but he didn't have a job. It was difficult for him to find a job because he had a lot of felonies. And he was talking to me about the stress of being a father and how the children needed things, needed school supplies, needed shoes. And like children do, they, all, they went to their father and he was actually present in the home. And they were asking for gym shoes and what have you. And he was beginning to stress. And I got the sense that he was be, uh, thinking about leaving. And I looked that young man in the eye and said, yes, it's your job to provide for your children, but don't forget the importance of your presence. And I understand you can't give your children everything that they need and want, but your presence is powerful. Think about that for a second. Your presence in the lives of your children 
is powerful. Even when you can't give them everything that they need, you can't give them everything that they, they want. Yes, it's your job to provide, but your presence is powerful. So many times I uh, always ask the question, which is more important, providing for your children or being present in your children's life? And both are important. Both, in my opinion, is the responsibility of a father, but you have, it's a balancing act. And a lot of men, we get busy making money to provide for our children, which is admirable. But also remember that your presence is powerful, meaning your presence have an effect on the lives of your children. When you're present, your children subconsciously feel secure. When you're present, your children subconsciously feel valued. Your presence lets your children know that they are worth it and that you want them. So let me close by giving uh, a message to young boys that are being raised by a woman. And in fact, it's really the foundation of why we do what we do. Again, remember the name of our organization is A Better Man Than Me. And I know that's not probably gr grammatically correct, but it's the whole reason why I started the organization. Because it's my desire to help young men be a better man than I am. And I work hard to be a good man. But I believe that every generation should get better. Every generation should be stronger, wiser, happier, healthier, and wealthier. But a lot of times we tend to make the same mistakes over and over again. Uh, we tend to repeat history and we tend to make the same mistakes that our father made. So the message that I give to young men, first of all, is that um, strive to be better and the decisions that you make today will impact your life tomorrow. So although your father may not be present, you are worth it, you are valuable, and the fact that you are breathing means that you have a reason to live and you have a mission in life. So my advice to you is to strive for perfection. None of us are perfect and you will never be perfect, but it is your job to uh, give back to society, it's your job to support your family, and it's your job to be a productive citizen and that you were born to produce. Don't just be a consumer. A lot of people go through life and they consume and they take, 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 and they never evolve to the next level, which is actually to produce, which is actually to give back. And a man that evolves, re evolves from having needs met to meeting needs. So my advice to you, young man, young boy that's being raised by a woman is that to set goals, reach for those goals and realize subconsciously realize in the innermost part of you, your being that you are worth it and never let another human being, your father, your grandfather, your mother, send a signal to you that you are a mistake. You're here, you're here to solve problems. You're here to give back and you're here to be a success. I'll end by the mission statement that we have to promote success and responsible stewardship among young men. I repeat that. The mission statement for our organization is to promote success and responsible stewardship among young men. It is our hope that you are successful, that you are responsible, and that you are a good steward over the resources that have been provided you.